Amen. Thank you, church. Oh, praise him in the center of it all. That, that means we've got to keep our eyes and our attention and our focus on him and not what's going on around us and to us, but to focus in on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in the final weeks of a little series that we have entitled um, The Privilege of Believers. And today we're looking uh, at a very sensitive subject and it is the privilege that you and I have of spiritual gifts. I really like what the Bible does when he describes what the church is like and he uses variable terms. He'll uh, use the term flock, uh, he'll also use the terms, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he'll use, uh, my favorite really is the body of Christ. You know, we all, uh, we all, we all uh, can identify with the term body. We live in one. Uh, we have uh, different assignments that have been given to each part of the body. To the eyes, the assignment is made to see. To the nose is to smell. To the ear, it is to hear. To the tongue, it is to taste and to speak. Oftentimes a body part will have more uh, than one function. And we understand when scriptures teach us that the church is the body of Christ. Now, um, in this church, uh, we don't think it's strange uh, to be called a member of the body of Christ. But what if, uh, what, if, what if you saw someone who had a perfectly healthy body, capable of walking and lifting and carrying and feeling, and uh, there was absolutely no malady that they possessed in their body at all, but they spent their entire life uh, being rolled around in a wheelchair. Now you would think that that would be strange. You would think that that would be odd. You'd think that there was something really wrong uh, with that person. And yet uh, in, in the church, we don't think it's strange at all uh, to be a part of the member of the body of Christ and then yet not functioning as a part of the member of the body of Christ. And we are content to just see people as they come and they watch and they listen and they take it all in but never participate in the way that God wants them to participate. Uh, and we think as part of the body of Christ that we can compensate for their lack. We can make it up. We somehow can add what God has assigned them to do to our own life and uh, we can just pick up where they don't and in their participation. Uh, but we... Uh, we think in terms really individualistically. Um, we think, uh, you know, I've got my own agenda. I have my own goals and have my own outline here in my life. And there are, by the way, 7,000 members of First Baptist Church in Indian Trail. And I am sure that my little contribution won't be missed. And somebody else in that 7,000 members will pick up my slack and it really looks like things are going pretty well with that. Well, the good news is that for every believer, there is a part that is given uh, for us to function within a part of the body of Christ. The Bible states that you and I serve a supernatural God who has a supernatural mandate to be carried out in a supernatural way by supernatural people that is ultimately going to have a supernatural effect. Now there's only one variable in that kind of a statement and it's simply, um, am I going to assume the responsibility that God has laid on me to carry that out or am I not gonna become involved in what I have been enlisted to? Now. Pew Research tells us that only 18% of the people who claim to be evangelicals are participating in the body of Christ. That means that 82% have absolutely no desire and no intention of ever 
getting plugged into the body of Christ. Now, we're also told that 50% of those 82% say that they would get involved in the body of Christ if somebody were simply to come alongside and enlist them to become a participant. Now, this morning, my goal is to show you how much of a privilege that it is to possess a spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writing to the church at Corinth and he is saying concerning spiritual gifts, uh, I don't want you to be ignorant. He says, I, I, I want you to have a good handle on this. I, I want you to be familiar with what God has uniquely gifted to you. I don't want you to stay in the dark. I want you to know what they are. I want you to know how they are to function. I want you to know how that you can uh, participate in the body of Christ in a productive manner. Now, why are spiritual gifts so very important? I want to give you six reasons why they're important. Go through them very rapidly. Spiritual gifts exalt the Lord. Notice with me, if you will, and take your Bibles and look to 1 Peter chapter number 4. And I want you to hold your spot there because uh, we're going to be looking at that passage quite extensively before we finish this morning. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 4, and I want you to see verse number 11. If any man speaks, speaking as it were oracles of God, if any man ministers, ministering as of the strength which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Understand, when you are functioning with the spiritual gift that God has given to you, then you are in a position where you're going to bring glory and honor to the Lord. Number two, they edify, spiritual gifts edify the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter number four tells us that when we're functioning together in the body of Christ, it builds up the body of Christ in love. Number three, spiritual gifts equip us and fuel us in the ministry of the church. In other words, spiritual gifts empower you and spiritual gifts equip you to do the work of the ministry. Number four, uh, spiritual gifts enable the church to function properly. Each part doing their jobs. Number five, spiritual gifts extend the work of Christ to the world. In other words, if you have the gift of helps, if you have the gift of mercy, you then plug that gift into the body of Christ and you're able to come alongside people and uh, uh, bring help to them and encouragement to them. But also uh, you take that same spiritual giftedness outside uh, the church, then you're able to touch the lives of many people wherever they may be. And then number six, spiritual gifts evangelize the lost. Praise God. Now, what I'm saying to you this morning is spiritual gifts are vitally important to life and to living. I want to give you four pillars uh, of the ministry. I think that you'll find them uh, to be refreshing. I don't think you'll find them to be new. It's just something that all of us need to be reminded of from time to time. First of all, uh, the first pillar is every member is a minister. Can you say that out loud with me? Every member is a minister. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible says, From whom all the body fitly framed and knit together through that which every joint supplies. Every member a minister. Uh, from time to time people ask me, how many members do you have at First Baptist Church Indian Trail? And the answer that many give at that question is that, well, we have 7,000 members, but we only have about 25 ministers. Now, that's a misnomer. That's not true. Uh, that's a misinterpretation. Because according to the Word of God, every believer is a, is a minister. And it's better said, we have 7,000 ministers and we have about 25 that come along and support. 7,000 uniquely gifted people of God in the body of Christ. I hope that you see the difference. Now, here's the deal. If we don't see ourselves as ministers, 
then we wind up seeing ourselves much differently. We see ourselves as someone then who needs to be ministered to. And, and this get into, get, we get into this need orientation and we're always looking to receive and become then a spiritual sponge. Um, l- let me share with you, if you're a believer here today, uh, you have been converted by God. You have been called out by God. You are called by God to be a minister. And you're either, listen, he drafted you into the kingdom of God. And you're either a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and ministering with your spiritual gift to meet the needs of other people or you're a draft dodger. That's the only option. You got drafted by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And somehow we've messed that up. All of us here have needs. There's not any person in the building this morning that doesn't have a need. But what God did in the design of his church and in his own body is he designed each one of the parts of that body to minister to the needs of others so that those needs could be met. That's the functioning part of the body of Christ. Pillar number two, every minister is important. Every minister is important. There's no little people in the kingdom of God. And you really need to be careful when you're seeing people up here with a microphone on the platform or you're seeing praise teams and you're seeing choir members and you're seeing people with badges running around here that you think, well, they're just serving in these important roles and I'm not gifted to do those kind of things. I am a nobody. That's not true. Every person in the kingdom of God is important. If you go read 1 Corinthians 12, you're going to discover that all of the body parts of Christ are important and none more important than another. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, the Bible says, wherefore, my beloved brethren, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor does not go unnoticed by God. So don't ever think that you're insignificant. Don't ever think that you are unimportant. You matter to God. Now, my my wife, we we just uh, got back from New England where I ministered to about uh, 250 preachers across a Massive six-state place. Uh, by, by the way, if you were to take those six states uh, that I was just a, a part of up there and you isolated them and made them their own country, uh, they would be identified as an unreached people group. We're talking about New York and Massachusetts and New Hampshire and Vermont. Those, those states that are in that top right corner of the United States, only 2% of them have Uh, any kind of relationship with God whatsoever. 98% of them have no affiliation uh, with the Lord uh, at all. God notices. Now, we we went up there and uh, we forgot a nightlight. Now, now my wife loves a nightlight. We get off in these strange uh, hotels that we've never been in before and the rooms are all laid out differently and uh, in the middle of the night, you, you, you turn one way and run into a wall because she, she likes to have a nightlight so that she can see when she gets up. Now, a nightlight's not very, I, I can't stand it, but my, my, you think that it's just a little insignificant thing. And as a matter of fact, in the daytime, it's absolutely useless. It, it, it has no value whatsoever in the daytime. But at night, it is vitally important and it shines to guide the way. May I say to you this morning that every minister and every ministry is important. Number three, we are dependent and interdependent on each other. 57 times in the scriptures, there is the term one another. God thought it significant enough that he identified the one another's and we need one another's. I got out of my car this morning and there were people lined up kind of to meet me as I came in the door and they loved on me going down the hall right before I got into the room where I got wired up with the microphone. Uh, there, there, was, there was a man who stopped me in the hallway 
and just really encouraged me in my life. I have people send me text messages and emails and I got a card I opened up a few minutes ago and it was just lavished encouragement on my heart. I don't know what I would do without the one another's in my life. We need each other. And then ministry is the expression of my unique giftedness. Hey, I want, I want to get into this now with you. I want to give you two things and then we're going to go home. I want to talk to you first of all, and we're going to look at this passage, uh, the privilege of divine uniqueness. Now we could stand up here this morning and we could talk and banter back and forth about spiritual gifts, what they are, what they are not, how many are available today, what are not available today, how many were just for the apostolic age and how many is current. We could talk about all of that. I'm not interested in doing that just today, but, but I am interested in talking to you about the privilege that you and I have with spiritual gifts. And it is a privilege. Watch with me now in chapter number four and verse 10 of First Peter. As every, say the word every, as every man hath received a gift, every believer has been given at least one spiritual gift that we are to get plugged in into the kingdom of God. You have been divinely given that gift by God. Paul says in that passage in 1 Corinthians, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant of that gift. It has a vital purpose in the kingdom of God. May I say to you as a believer, we matter in the living church of God. First of all, we've been uniquely defined. The New American Standard says that we've been given a special gift. Now, I brought a definition with me that I, I want to share what that definition is, and I want you to listen closely. Your gift is a supernaturally endowed enablement that God gives you at the point of salvation for the purpose of ministering in the body of Christ. Paul calls it in Romans chapter 12 that it's a grace gift. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, he talks about the manifestation of those gifts. In other words, the gift that God has uniquely and divinely given to us is to be on display, not so that people could draw attention to you, but so that God could be glorified uh, in the process of that. Your, your unique gift not only was divinely given, it was uniquely distributed. I wonder how many of you have said something like this. Well, you know, I understand God passes out spiritual gifts, but, you know, when, it, when, when he got to me, he overlooked me. He bypassed me. It went over me. I, I just don't have any spiritual gift. I can't sing and I can't teach and all of this stuff. I, I am just anemic when it comes to spiritual giftedness. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a myth. If you look at verse 10, he says everybody, Everybody that God has called to himself has been granted a spiritual gift. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, the Bible says, but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Now, the word individually there is a, is a good word. Um, in the Greek, it's the word idios. Now, guess what word? that we derive from that word, idiot. Now, the definition of that means that there's something odd or peculiar or unique like no one else. Now, here's what could happen today. Because God individually gave you a special unique gift designed just for you in your personality, in your abilities, God gave it to you you could be able to stand up in the congregation this morning and simply shout, hey guys, none of you have the spiritual gift that I have. 
nobody's got the same gift that I do. I'm different than everybody else. And that would be true. He uniquely gave you that. You matter to God. And it's wonderful to come to the conclusion in your life that God wants to use you for his glory and his honor. Myth number two, you say, well, uh, maybe I have a gift. Uh, I can't figure out what gift I want to have. So I'm just going to pray about which of the, somebody has counted about 29. Um, I'm just going to pray about which of the 29 gifts that I want. And so you, you get you a list and you say, well, do I want that? Do I want to do that? No, that's a myth. The choice of what gift you are bestowed does not rely on you. Uh, God picked that out just for you. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, just as he wills, whatever God determined for you to have, that's he gave to you. Now, myth number three, you say, I might have a gift. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep on praying about what gift that I want. I see that that's what God has determined. Um, uh, but but uh, 1 Peter chapter four, verse 10 says, uh, the manifold grace of God. Watch this with me again in verse 10. As every man hath received the gift, even so uh, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold, the variable colored grace of God. In, in other words, uh, don't ever think that your gift won't make a difference. That's a myth. Your gift will make a difference. Uh, it, we, we're all different in the body of Christ. Nobody can take your place. Now, number three, your gift is uniquely discovered. You say, all right, pastor, I'm with you. I know that uh, my gift is unique. I know it's uniquely uh, uh, distributed, but I can't find my place in the body of Christ. You, you know, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something that you may have never thought about before, never read about you, you can study the Bible and nowhere in the Bible will you find where you are to discover uh, what your spiritual gift is. Nowhere where you're commanded to discover what that gift is. The Bible is assuming that you are and will minister your gift as you, as you minister for the glory of God. You, you know what I, I think people do oftentimes? Well, I don't know what my spiritual gift is, so I'm, I'm just not going to participate. I think that's an excuse of laziness in the body of Christ. So you say, how am I supposed to find out? How am I well, learn about spiritual gifts. Then jump into something that you have a passion for. Jump into something that you have a desire to do. Now, you may get over there in the midst of what you're passionate about and discover, man, I hate that. That was not what I thought it was going to be. And you're not bearing fruit about it. Then get out of it and go do something else. Uh, then examine your interests. What are you interested in? What are you passionate about? Uh, figure that out. What motivates me? to get involved. What natural abilities do I possess that God has given to me that he may be able to use alongside with my spiritual gift to bring glory to himself? Now, this morning is a big deal. You saw it on the video that we are, by the way, we're not looking for volunteers. You're drafted, remember? We're looking for servants. Uh, in the preschool department, you say, I want to tell you one thing, that's not my gift. I've heard about all of the horror stories that are coming out of the preschool department. I'm not going to, let me just tell you, the only horror stories you've heard are from people who are trying to operate in an area of ministry where they're not spiritually gifted. Then look at your own fruitfulness. Where are you bearing Fruit, ask somebody, ask a close friend that's walking with God, filled with the Spirit. What do you think that I'm, I'm spiritually gifted to do? Ask your spouse. Well, i am only got a few minutes to go here and I've got major stuff to talk to you about. So let, let me give you number two is the privilege of dynamic usefulness. Watch again in verse 10 and 11. As every man hath received the gift, even so 
minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak of the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God gives. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, you know, when I, when I read the Bible, I am deeply encouraged when I look at the trials and the difficulties of the great men of God that are contained in the Word of God. I'll give you an example. Paul's writing to Timothy. Timothy's really messed up at church. He's trying to pastor a church. He's run into brick walls uh, ministry-wise and personal-wise. And what was the advice that Paul gave to Timothy? He says, Timothy, stir up the gift that is within you. If you read the second letter that he wrote, he wrote the same thing. Stir up the gift that God has uniquely bestowed on you. When I was growing up over in the western part of North Carolina, uh, I grew up uh, with my grandparents and, and we had a kind of a, 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 a self-contained family unit there. And I learned real quick that if I didn't work, uh, I wasn't gonna eat. If I didn't go hoe corn, if I didn't feed the chickens, if I didn't gather the eggs, if I didn't uh, throw the hay up into the, to the barn and go to the hay fields, it, I, I wasn't going to have anything to eat. So I learned real quick the, the work ethic in, in, in this thing. But what's happened today, we've become desensitized to that in our culture. By the way, folks, ladies and gentlemen, you really need to be paying particular attention to what's going on uh, in the political world today that is pushing and leaning more and more towards socialism that is geared up to this very thing that when people decide, well, I just don't want to work, I don't want to do this because I know that if I don't do my part, then the government is going to come and take care of me. Be very careful. But now listen to this. Um, that's bled over into the church and we're setting ourselves up for spiritual disaster when we sit back and think that God is so gracious that if I don't get involved and if I don't get plugged in, if I don't use my spiritual gift, if I don't serve, then God is going to make up the difference in the area of my weakness. Do you know what I call that? I call it spiritual freeloading. We come on a Sunday morning and we sit down and we take it all in. And we watch and we listen and we observe and if everybody does a good job, then it's a finish of the service when the basket is passed, I may throw in a couple of bucks. That's not the way God says church ought to operate. Four things jump out at me in this text. Number one, he says to employ your spiritual gift. Verse 10, even so minister, serve, get involved. It's black and white here, ladies and gentlemen. There is no such thing as unemployment in the kingdom of God. You have the privilege because you've been uniquely gifted with a spiritual gift to make it better. Number two, your ministry is to serve one another. May I say to you that the gift that God has bestowed on you is not for you. You're to mix it up with other people into the body of Christ and you're to serve one another with those gifts. Number three, we're to use it reliably. Do you see the term as good stewards? You understand that God wants a return on his investment? Tony Evans made this statement recently. I want you to listen to what he said. He says, don't tell me God is your everything when he can get nothing out of you. Don't tell me God's been good to you when you don't have time for the God who's been good to you. God wants a return on this investment. And then we're to use it reverently. In other words, it's to glorify God. So when I employ the spiritual gift that God's given me to serve other people, and I do it consistently and reliably, inevitably what verse 10 says, that it is going to bring glory and honor to God. May I say to you this morning, that's the bottom line of every ministry, is to bring glory to God. 
It's the bottom line of every ministry at First Baptist Indian Trail. It ought to be the bottom line of the men's ministry. It ought to be the bottom line of the ladies' ministry. It ought to be the bottom line of Awana. It ought to be the bottom line of missions. It ought to be the bottom line of sports. It ought to be the bottom line of music and worship. It ought to be the bottom line of life groups bringing glory to God. And if that's not the bottom line of what we do, then in the name of Jesus, we need to shut it down. Bring glory to God. I want to close with this, with this verse. I, I just read it this week. I know that I've read it many times before, but it never hit me like it did this week. It's found in Jeremiah 48.10. And the Bible says, Cursed be the one who does the Lord's work negligently. Powerful admonition. Powerful word. Cursed be the one who does the work, Lord's work negligently. I wonder how many of us could honestly, genuinely, sincerely say, you know, Pastor, I'm plugged in. And I, I know what my task is in the body of Christ. I, I, I know that God has me where he wants me to be and I know that I'm being used of him and I know that the body of Christ is stronger because I'm involved in it. Are you involved in a life group? Are you involved in a ministry? Is your spiritual gift bringing glory and honor to Jesus? Are you serving other people in some role and some capacity in your life? Oh, friend, if not, I plead with you this morning, determine, you know what? God didn't just save me to get me into heaven. God didn't just save me to get me out of hell. God saved me to make a difference. And I matter. And I want to serve the Lord. And I want to serve him in the area of my giftedness. I may not know what it is right now, but I'm going to discover what it is. I want to figure it out. And I want God to be glorified in all that I do. Would you stand with me and let's pray together? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word that is, is such a tremendous reminder to us of why you saved us and what we're to do and where you get glory. Father, I pray if there are those that are here this morning that have really never gotten plugged in or maybe they used to be plugged in and, and, and they just drifted by the wayside and, and God, they're a spectator now rather than a participant. God, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would draw people to a level of commitment this morning where their lives would make a difference, where they can matter, where the kingdom of God could be glorified. And may it be so in every believer's life. Lord, we do have a privilege today of being the recipient of your giftedness. And Lord, we do know you expect a return on your investment. Have your will and way in our life today. Draw people to a commitment. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.